The conference is to come up with recommendations vis-à-vis what the science has told us about the management of substance use disorders. And this is in preparation of the 2016 assembly meeting that's going to be taking place here in Vienna uh, to make decisions on the management of drugs. I am the chair for the scientific advisory on the prevention and treatment of substance use disorders. So I have to act to coordinate the responses from the different scientists and to give the presentation to the members. The United Nations wanted to have the advice of the scientific community to be able to guide policy on the basis of scientific evidence. So the people that were in the committee were all scientists from different places of the world and represented different um, disciplines from clinical sciences to basic neurosciences to epidemiology and uh, prevention research. Well, I think that there is, uh, the very positive reception that we go vis-à-vis uh, -vis the recommendations based on science makes me believe that there is an increased openness on the recognition that we need science in order to solve the problems of substance use disorder, that's one. Second, too, but there's also a lot of interest on in coming with standards, global standards, that integrate measures that can help in the prevention and treatment of substance use disorders. And there was also a big endorsement of the recognition that addiction is a disease of the brain and that it is important to address it as a, a public health medical issue rather than a criminal justice or moral issue. That, that, that concept has been embraced and endorsed not just as an acceptance but in terms of how do you manage the problem of substance use disorders. Well, one of the recommendations is that the healthcare system should be intimately involved and should have the responsibility for early screening and interventions and also, depending on the severity, for the re referral to specialized treatment. So there's the recognition that the healthcare system should take that responsibility, but also that it should be provided with the resources, which include the proper training of personnel, as well as the infrastructure that will allow it to be a first-line defense in terms of early recognition and prevention of addiction, but also its treatment. What, what we know from the evidence is that uh, the age group that's most vulnerable for drug use uh, and dangerous drug use is the adolescents and that most of the transition between experimentation of drug use and addiction occurs in late adolescence, uh, early adulthood and those interventions that target that group are likely to be most effective. However, we cannot neither negate the importance of being able to recognize a substance use disorder in an adult, because if not, that could lead to very adverse consequences. So yes, there is a particularly vulnerable stage in development, adolescence, young adulthood, for the process of addiction, but um, still it's important to intervene later on. And the other aspect about uh, the whole issue of the screening and intervention is the recognition that you need to do a screening for all substances of abuse, whether they are legal or illegal. That in the healthcare system, the distinction basically should not be made. It should be actually always screened systematically. Alcohol and tobacco, illicit substances, as well as psychotherapeutic medications that may be abused. Well, the, the first line, the most effective line of prevention are the parents. And the parent recognizing that this is part of their job of being a good parent, to speak with their children as small as they are and start very early on in a way that um, leaves them conf uh, gives them confidence to communicate with you as they grow up into adolescence if they are curious about trying drugs, if friends have taken drugs, uh, and they feel, they feel they can have that dialogue, to open that dialogue, to speak very early on about what drugs are and why it does not make sense to use them, even though you may temporarily feel good, that in the long term you will start to feel bad when you don't have them and even when you get them the ability to feel good will be increasingly diminished so you will end up by taking them just to feel normal 
So that dialogue, that communication, that sense of trust, and very important, the emotional support that uh, the children and adolescents need. Because many times uh, adolescents take drugs, not because they want to get high, but because they feel very isolated and they don't have alternatives and they have parental neglect. So, or they don't know. And so, or they see their parents taking drugs. And so what I advise parents is, first of all, do not become complacent. Don't think that it cannot happen to your child. Any kid is vulnerable and, and that's why parents should be alerted and should have a dialogue. Well, I, I, my, my role in the administration of the substance use disorders arena has been on the science. So administering the science and what projects get funded and what may be priorities. And there's been enormous advances in the neuroscience and there, there are significant interventions for which scientifically there is evidence that they work for prevention, for example. There's also very significant uh, interventions for the treatment that, that it works. And yet they are not being implemented, they are not being used. So, so that's one of the big challenges that we face, certainly in the United States, but in many other places in the world, that you do have the evidence of prevention but it's not used. So we have, and the same with treatment, so we have both a prevention gap and a treatment gap. And in the area of research, therefore, what we're trying to understand is how do you implement? How, 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 and then if you implement, how do you sustain? And that is something that, that not necessarily scientists think. So it's not just about having the knowledge, we have it. We, we already have many interventions that work. How do we implement? To your question, what do I see in the future? Well, we are doing, uh, science is advancing at tremendous pace, and it's just extraordinary. And uh, so our knowledge has increased, but also that technology is enabling us to start to think of new ways, for example, for treat or even prevent addiction. A perfect example that has become one of the main initiatives that we're pushing scientists is the development of vaccines. Vaccines against nicotine, vaccines against cocaine, vaccines against heroin. And the idea of these vaccines right now is predominantly as potential treatments. And what they will do is if someone that is a heroin abuser and they relapse, if they are vaccinated, the vaccine will not allow the drug to get into the brain. So they won't have literally the relapse. It will interfere with that relapse. But if we succeed on getting these vaccines to work in humans with no negative effects, then you could even conceive of, of vaccines as potential prevention interventions. I mean, so certainly this is something that one has to think very carefully about, but ultimately I do believe it is important to put in the table, if we can develop that technology at that level, why not? And then make an analysis of could there be potential negative consequences, but otherwise I don't see any benefits of having someone smoking cigarettes, if we can prevent tobacco, we will basically prevent a lot of deaths. If we can prevent cocaine, we prevent a lot of addictions and unnecessary suffering. And so, so that's so the same thing with heroin. If we can prevent heroin and injection of heroin, we can prevent a lot of the infections with HCV, HIV, and all of the negative consequences from overdosing. So I think that this is where I see where the science is going to be taking us five or ten years. And I, and I yeah, well, with science, there's always um, an unpredictable element, so I don't want to say in five or ten years. But I could see the, the very transformative uh, tools happening in the next five or ten years that are going to allow us to treat addiction in very different ways from what we have been doing until recently. So, um, I mean, and it, you, you see it, and you see it in the United States, and I think that part of that trend, on the one hand there are two trends, the one on the recreational marijuana and the one on the legalizing medical marijuana, and you see that dialogue being taken by other countries. And in my view, since they are already legalized into states, what we've done is fund researchers to look into the consequences that this legalization is having vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, educational achievement, vis-a-vis -vis dropouts from school, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, admissions into emergency rooms, or vis-a-vis -vis admissions into treatment programs for substance use disorders. Can we monitor those consequences vis-a-vis -vis the number of car accidents associated with marijuana intoxication? And, and with those numbers, we can then find out if, 
Is this policy really leading us into a whole series of negative impacts? And then that information can be used by others. So, I, or alternatively, you'll find out, and I said, well, curiously, the system was able to control and regulate, which would be a wonderful surprise. You have to see the data and let the data tell you what it is. My prediction on the basis of what we have lived in the past with like a, the legal drugs is that uh, the legal drugs increase the number of people that get exposed to them just by the fact of them being legal and by just probability you end up with having many more people with adverse effects.